Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Asian Fantasy Fiction Podcast. I'm your host, Jeremy Bai, also known online as Deathblade. I am a translator and a writer who specializes in Chinese fantasy, specifically genres like wuxia, xianxia, and xuanhuan. And my latest project is called The Nine Heavens and Ten Earths, which you can find on Amazon. But enough about me. Let's get to today's guest. This is the inaugural first episode, and I knew exactly who I was going to invite on as the guest, uh, Et Voler. She is a wuxia xianxia and period drama translator, and she is currently based out of Taipei. She grew up between Taiwan and the United States, which is something I want to pick her mind about shortly. Uh, she has translated about 9 million uh, Chinese characters, and in case you don't know what that means, that's like a, a lot of Chinese characters. If you convert that into words, that's probably something around 6 million or, or so words. She is currently working on Necropolis Immortal uh, on Wuxia World and Return of the Swallow on Valer Novels. And she's the host of the Moon Quill podcast, and she posts uh, translation related thoughts on her blog at etvolaire.com. Of course, she is not only a translator, she has a background in other things, including acronyms that I don't necessarily know what they mean because I am only uh, an art major in college. I don't have any kind of fancy acronyms attached to my name. She's an MBA, a CPA, a CFA, level one. Anyway, she is an expert in many things. And so welcome to the inaugural episode of the Asian Fantasy Fiction Podcast at Valer. Thanks, Stevie. Hey, everyone. I'm Etvo, as my readers frequently call me. And honestly, I am really, really excited to be here. Thank you for having me as your inaugural guest. I'm honestly so happy for you and also really excited for you to be taking, I guess, your next steps. I, so I've been in the scene for a few years. I think this will be my sixth year, actually. DB, though, is my senior. He is my senpai. <laughs> he is an idol that I look up to, honestly. He has translated, I'm sure people who've been, like readers who've been in the scene for a while, they have definitely read something that DB has done. And now that he's venturing into originals, of like it's giving me a lot of food for thought as well and a lot of motivation to keep moving forward in my own projects and even though I'm super busy right now I am still making time to go through a couple pages of his latest novel every day it's pretty dang awesome well thank you and uh, I mean we have actually been talking about doing something together for a really really long time whether talking about YouTubes or collaborations and if I remember if I'm if I'm my memory serves me correctly the last time we actually did something together would have been on I Shall Seal the Heavens when I did a live read and you joined me as uh, the voice for one of the female characters. And at this point, that was probably about five years ago or six or four years ago or something oh like that. Wow, that long ago? I'm not it was sure. It was toward the end of I Shall Seal the Heavens. I want to say uh, so. Yeah, probably more like four years because my son's five. He's like the the sort of way I gauge how long I've been a translator because I was just starting I Shall Seal the Heavens when he came along. So anyway, the point is, it's been a long time. And so finally, here we are. And yeah, I'm excited too to be able to uh, do this podcast. I The whole point of this thing is to basically just have conversations with people who are uh, in this field, kind of pick their brain and just give them a chance to talk about what they're working on and their their philosophy. So um yeah, I did want to talk about the Taiwan thing because it, you kind of grew up between Taiwan and, and America and then you you have lived in both places. And although I didn't grow up in two different places, I did live between uh, the States and China. And of course, you know, the place where I lived in China is very different from where you're living now, uh, but kind of a similar thing. And so I'm curious your take on on that. What 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 do you which place do you prefer i'm gonna i, I have a, a a theory uh but what is your preference as of now having lived in both places i mean i mean this is a bit of an unfair answer because i feel like okay well regardless it wouldn't change so um i it's unfair because taiwan did have its like act together for the pandemic. So life has been pretty normal for me for the past year and a half. So if we're going to say right now, this very second 2021, of course, it would be Taiwan. But I did move back to Taipei about four years ago. So I'd made my choice then already. I do prefer living in Taipei. 
but mostly as like a home base, I still travel around Asia and back to the States very frequently as well. Um, I kind of guess you were going to say that. And I, I actually, one of the things you were, you really excel at, in my opinion, is social media. I think you actually really trounce me <laughs> on social media in terms of you just post a lot of interesting stuff. I, I've kind of run out of steam and just kind of post translation related stuff, but you have like beautiful pictures on your Instagram and, and uh, Twitter and a lot of them just uh, stuff you take yourself in Taipei and you really do make it uh, I don't want to say you make it seem like a beautiful city. You portray its beauty. Let's put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> um, did, do I remember correctly that you used to live in New York City or was was it somewhere else? Yep, that's that's right. I used to. So in the States, I spent a lot of time in New York City, also spent a year in the Bay Area, actually, and then a few mm. other years in the southern states, so Okay, kind of all over. So I, yeah, you know, I feel like we would have talked about this before at some point, whether because we've met each other in person once, which is in Thailand, and then we've talked in other times. Mm -hmm. But I honestly can't remember what what part of New York City you lived in, if you don't mind me asking. And the reason I'm asking is because I also lived in New York City as well, and I'm curious if we were in similar neighborhoods. I lived on Manhattan, basically in Chinatown on Manhattan, like a uh, East Broadway little Fuzhou area. Were you anywhere oh, near there? Brilliant. I would go there on weekends for dim sum. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I mostly lived in a, a midtown. So like midtown west or like midtown central, or like midtown east, like midtown. Because I, I lived in New York when I still worked in finance. So working those crazy long ass hours, I wanted to live near work. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And hold on a second. So you moved back in four years ago. I was in New York City uh, let's see here. It would have been uh, between 2000, probably, I guess, 2007 to 2000 or 2008 to 2010, I think. That wasn't when you were there, was it? Or was it? No, okay. no. Dang, we missed each other. We like, missed each other. Okay. Perfectly. Yeah. Uh, okay. Got it. All right. So uh, moving on, because I'm trying to keep things a little bit fast paced here. Uh, before we get into specific stuff that you're working on, I was just was curious about your influences, whether it's TV shows, games or books, things like that. What are the things that you consider to be uh, things that inspire you, whether it's in your translating work, or I know you're also starting to consider dabbling in original works. What is the stuff that kind of drives you? Um, what drives me to really change my career from finance to translations, it, I would say it's definitely all of the Wuxia TV shows and movies that I grew up on. So I was born in the States and then kind of split my time growing up between Taiwan and the States. But I attended one of the international schools here. So I was in a very much of an American environment most of the time which meant that my Chinese actually wasn't the greatest, to be honest. I couldn't, I, if you were to give me a wuxia novel when I was in middle school or something like that, I wouldn't be able to read it. There was just too many idioms or hard phrases or just characters I couldn't recognize. So growing up, it was definitely all of the TV shows. Oh my gosh, I loved them, loved them so much. And then I was, I'm, I was, and I still am a huge, huge bookworm. So I basically read, I think, just about every single book in my library, school's library. I think I might still hold the record because I think I plowed through like, I don't know, like 1,200 books in uh, five or six years, something crazy like that. So uh, that was that definitely forms really solid foundations for my work now in terms of writing, in terms of translating, and then in terms of what I think readers might want to read. And that kind of has to do with when I'm considering what I might write for my own originals. Cool. That's it. That rings a bell with me because when I was in high school, I was kind of in a similar position. I, I didn't keep track throughout high school and college, but I remember I had a, I want to say sophomore year of high school, we had a thing where we were supposed to keep track of all the books we read and the page numbers, mm -hmm. and we got like extra credit. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, yeah. The, the teacher like gave us, you know, an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper with like a, a table on it. And I had to get like five of those sheets of paper. I forget. It was something like a hundred books. Mm -hmm. I, so I don't know if I can match your um, amount of books read, but I definitely was was similar. Now, going let's let's kind of jump into your pers into your uh, pr uh, translation projects at this point. So, under your belt, you have Sovereign of the Three Realms, Doomed to Be Cannon Fodder, Great Demon King, 
And then you're currently working on, like I mentioned uh, earlier, Necropolis Immortal and Return of the Swallow. What is your take on all of those as your body of translation work? Like what has been your experience going back and forth between so many different projects? Were they, were they all kind of similar? Were they Are they very different from each other? Great question. So um, they, this is kind of like a walk down memory lane because Sovereign of the Three Realms is my first novel. So my first foray into the scene and Great Demon King, I kind of did that concurrently. So I've always kind of had multiple novels going at the same time, which I totally kind of regret now. <laughs> a bit too much of a workaholic going for me right there. And um, But I've always ventured, I've always split my time between say Xianxia and something else that was very different. So I, I like variety. I purposely try to pick something different to keep my work fresh and interesting. So I'm not just, you know, you know, these novels and listeners, I'm sure you guys will know too, these novels are long and you can easily translate just a single series for like three to four years. So for me, variety is definitely the spice of life. I don't think I'd be able to work on just one thing for such a long time. And fantasy and sci-fi are my bread and butter. So if I have Xianxia, then Great Demon King was much more definitely Xuan Huan or fantasy, Western fantasy, actually. And then Doom to be Cannon Fodder was more of a rom-com. And now Necropolis Immortal is also Xianxia, but I would describe it as a, it's a, it's a very different Xianxia. It's not your typical Xianxia formula. And then Return of the Swallow is a female lead that's very heavy on politicking and scheming. So I, I've always ventured and gone for stuff that's a little bit off the beaten path. You kind of answered the first question that popped to mind, which was about the having multiple projects at the same time. So your take is basically you like that, right? Yeah. Yes, but I will say I regret having two long form novels going right, right now <laughs> because like, so I started ROS Return of the Swallow about three years ago. I think so. Yeah, something like that. And then Necropolis Immortal I started last year. So, uh, you know, just like when you start out in the scene and, you know, you pick your first novel, you're, you're not thinking much about it. And if you're lucky, you've learned something from your experiences. So by the time you finish that and you pick your second one, you make a better choice. Yeah. I, I I think I did. I picked like better novels that I liked for sure. I, I knew like what tropes I wanted to steer away from and what I wanted to explore. But then I hadn't factored in on my interests changing a little bit. So like now, for instance, I definitely want to explore originals. You know, having been in the scene and doing translated work for six years, yeah, you know, you kind of get a few ideas and stuff you want to explore. And then... I host a podcast with Moon Quill. You know, I also dabble in, in some other stuff on the side, but like I don't have time <laughs> to do all of that because I've locked myself into two long novels. Yeah, I mean, I 100% know what you're talking about. And <laughs> yeah. it's, it, I mean, there's ups and downs to everything, but the downside to being a translator of the web literature is that you can't really just, you know, try something out for a little bit. You, you kind of have to commit. And as you mentioned before, it can be years that you're working on, you know, one project. So that that can definitely be a, a, a challenge. Speaking of switching between projects, so at this point, I would say I, so I have translated smaller novels, but that was before I started doing it like full time. In terms of the doing it full time, I've basically gone between three series, I Shall Sell the Heavens, A Will Eternal, Sage Monarch. You have picked up and finished more than three what has been your experience transitioning between different projects, ending one, starting another? Uh, is there any kind of uh, trick that you use to sort of change your mindset between the different genres you're translating or, uh, you know, applying, whether it's marketing or translating or whatever uh, t mm -hmm. tips and tricks you picked up from previous novels, applying them to new, new novels? How has that process been for you over the years, uh, switching between basically five different major projects, I think is, is your current count. Yep. Yep. And um, it's definitely much easier when you're switching, going off, you're rolling off of a completed series and going on to a completely new one, because then you can really close the chapter on the previous one and then start anew for the new one. And I generally would probably take, you know, a few days off or a week off. And that's insane, only taking a week off. But then I start to get that itch about wanting to, to work with 
to work again and to read the new material. So I definitely take a mental and physical break from work. But then if it's ongoing series, like I have two active ones right now, it um, it helps that I've done both of them for more than a year now. Uh, and I'm roughly halfway through ROS and about a quarter of the way through Necro. And it, it, I, what I have to do is I end up having to partition my day. Like I can't work on half of one chapter and jump to the other novel, work on half of that one, and then come back. It would just be like a mishmash of weird craziness and awful writing. Right. So I definitely maybe spend like you know the first half of the day on one novel, and then the rest of the day on the other one. I mean, that's, that's probably a similar routine to what you've come up with, maybe. Uh, yeah, I mean, I so I am more on the camp of not liking to split myself between multiple projects. I find it hard to shift my mindset. I've, I've done uh, I've done situations where I was translating two series at the same time. Specifically, I was doing I Shall Sell the Heavens and A Will Eternal uh, concurrently for a while. And then I also did a I did an original novel. One of my um, novels, Legends of Ogre Gate. I was doing that and splitting it. I think it was with I Shall Still the Heavens, but it might have been A Will Eternal, I forget. And both were challenging. I I, I prefer to kind of like stick to one thing and and uh, focus everything on that. That's just kind of how I am. But when I do have to split, basically, yeah, I I don't do it on a daily basis. I mean, I don't like work on one thing one half of the day, another thing the other half of the day. I like to split it between work on this thing this day, work on this thing that day, but kind of basically the same thing, splitting it. Mm-hmm. I, I would say I split my weeks up as opposed to my days. That's how I oh, how I tend to do yeah, it. Yeah, that's right. I think I remember us talking about your schedule once. Um, I was going to say, um, dang it, I forgot what I was going to uh, say. <laughs> okay, you'll remember it later. Don't worry. Between the the two projects you're now doing, so you have Necropolis Immortal and Return of the Swallow. Which do you think um, is the which which one do you think people need to know about more? Oh, wait, I remember what I was going okay. to say. Oh, my gosh, say, sorry. It's okay. Jump, jump back. <laughs> right. what were you uh, say? Yeah, yeah. Real quick, to circle back on the, the whole the schedule uh, question, um, I, going forward, I would prefer to not have two long-form novels. I want to have one long-form and then just, you know, sm- shorter projects off to the side, whether it's my own original or just t- chilling out, taking a break, or sometimes I get offers to uh, try t- and be part of just different projects. For instance, I was asked to be part of an anthology coming out next summer, and I squeeze that into the very limited spare time I have. So you know, I want to be able to pick up more stuff like that. Um, but yeah, otherwise, I tend to prefer, I guess, chopping my time up into smaller chunks because once you know you get in that groove, you know how the characters are speaking and everything's just flowing perfectly. I don't want to take a break like too long of a break from that because I'm a, I'm worried I'll, I'll get out of the zone and I'll have to spend some a few hours or something like that picking up that feeling again so that's yeah. why I do like half days yeah yeah I, I totally get it I my I mean my specific schedule has changed throughout the years and also having kids you know th- throws everything into chaos yes. in general uh, but right now I basically do like uh, Monday to uh, Monday Tuesday Wednesday and Thursday is just straight writing like that's it and then I have well some light editing, and then on Fridays I do full editing, and then Fridays and Saturdays, the time not spent on editing on Friday and Saturdays, uh, I have set aside for either emergencies or for uh, random other projects. Like I'm working for two different Chinese game companies right now, doing content for them. Mm-hmm. So it's the same kind of thing, though, whether it's shifting between translations or shifting between novels, similar kind of thing. Um, anyway. Uh, back to the question that I <laughs> asked a moment ago. Between Necro and ROS, which one do you think deserves, you know, a little bit more attention from the audience? Or I should say, oh. let me let me let me reword that. Which one do you think is underrated or people should know more about? That's what I'm asking. Both. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Like, yes, great answers. Very helpful. Uh, (laughs) No, for real, though, guys, for real. Like, okay. Um, uh, So for both Necro and ROS, I purposefully picked stuff that wasn't like the tried and true. So when you think of female lead, 
people might think, oh, you know, reverse harem or face slapping and, you know, white, li- uh, white lotuses and green tea biatches and stuff <laughs> like that. <laughs> and all that does fact that makes like an appearance in ROS. But then you also get like a ton of politicking, a ton of scheming, a ton of war strategy. I've actually had readers describe it as a Chinese Game of Thrones. And I'm like, hells yeah, that's awesome. This novel is awesome. And then I realize people are like, yeah, this is a little too much for me. Like, it's neither here nor there. So I'm like, oh, guys, I'm so sad. How do you not see its beauty? <laughs> and um, the author actually wrote me into it as I, I have a cameo in both of these series, actually. And I'm actually the second female lead in ROS. So I'm like, guys, come on, you got to read this. <laughs> wow, I didn't know that. That, that is awesome. Yeah. I think I might be the only translator with this type of accomplishment, maybe. I'm going to, you know, just unashamedly say that. Uh, so, yeah, I, I picked up ROS when I was still going. So I got to the author early enough where she could incorporate my character more. Whereas with Necro, I only picked it up after he was, I think, about halfway through. So I have a cameo there as well. But it's much more minor. I'm not the second female lead. <laughs> that is very cool. I mean, I so tongue in cheek story about this is that, and I, I'll try to keep this brief. But we had a contest for I Shall Seal the Heavens, where the winners uh, got a trip to China to meet the author, and right. this was never really announced publicly or anything. We took pictures and everything, and and Ren, the owner of Wushu World, just never talked about it in public. I don't know why, but it actually did happen. And we took two fans to China. And so we were having dinner. Now, incidentally, these two fans uh, were, both of them were like taller than me. I'm six feet tall, by the way. Both were taller than me, uh, a, a guy and a girl, uh, both blonde hair, blue eyes. I mean, she was beautiful. He's like handsome. Uh, wow. And so the, the author Argon was kind of you know, starstruck sort of <laughs> being able to be around these cool, you know, hip, um, good looking foreigners. And so during the dinner, as they were chatting, he just was like, oh, hey, I'm going to write two characters into my next novel for you two. And they were like super Whoa. thrilled and stuff. And I'm thinking, dang, man, I translated millions of characters <laughs> of your work. Yeah. Don't I get a guy, like, even a villain, you can kill me. Yeah. I'm just kind of joking. But uh, but yeah. Come on. Yeah. Argon. Oh. Where, where is that cameo? Come on. <laughs> yeah. Between the two yeah. of... Uh, uh, Necropolis, Mortal, and Return of the Swallow, which is the most challenging for you as a, a, on the translation side? Uh, definitely Necro. And I think Necro would be the actual answer to your previous question as well. That's the one I really wish that people pay more attention to. Not only because it's much more difficult, because the author loves borrowing from Taoism, from Buddhism, from a lot of different myths and cultures. And, and Necropolis Immortal deals primarily with tomb raiding. So when you get to, you know, to tomb raiding, there's also the world of hell, the underworld, all that mythology. And then you tie that into all the other stuff we usually have in a Xinxia novel. So cultivation system, some sort of overarching uh, world history, you know, mysteries and stuff like that. It, there is a lot of stuff happening in Necro. And the author, then uh, this is one of the reasons why I picked the series up. It's because I was so impressed by the author. He actually plans his stuff out. And like longtime readers of web novels will know that this doesn't necessarily always happen. <laughs> but he, I can tell he actually makes outlines and actually writes, uh, writes out precisely what he wants to do. And I've seen announcements in which he's actually taken days off because he wasn't very happy about his outline for the next arc. So he has done a lot of homework, a lot of research. And I really like Necro because it's unconventional. So it, with Xinxia web novels or just web novels in general, you know, you get a lot of filler, you get a lot of non-plot progression because authors are paid by word count, you know, so it's only natural if they have a hit on their hands, you got to pad that out. So that's your rent money, you know, that's your school tuition fees. But with Necro's author, he does not pad out anything. There's no filler. And that was actually one of, another big reason why I chose that. It was just such a joy to read when there's no filler. Yeah. And he yeah. doesn't like spoon feed you stuff. So, you know, another common like attribute you see from these novels is info dumps. Yeah, masquerading as actual chapters, but it's just like huge info dumps everywhere. And so what he does is he presents information to you as the MC is discovering it. 
sometimes the information is wrong if the MC made a mistake. So it's it's really it's it's fun. It's off the beaten path. I find that really. I don't know what the right adjective to use is, but it's. I find it amazing that there are authors that can do that well. For me personally, uh, over the past few months of my original, it's. I have. I have done outlines and planned things and I have world building. And then as soon as I start writing, I immediately just start going off of outline. I've come to the realization that I'm definitely more on the discovery writer side than, than the outline writer. But the fact that they can put together these stories, crank them out at such high speed and, you know, have them go for so many chapters with interconnected plots. I just, I, that's really amazing to me. Um, I did want to make another point though, which is, uh, I have a theory which you know you can weigh in on uh, cool. sort of relating to what you were talking about, which is I feel that four or five years ago when things were just starting out, it's it was a very different scene. And nowadays, there is so much content out there and so many new uh, series and novels popping up all the time, whether it's on Wish World or other places. I feel like it's a very different scene now. And in terms of getting a new audience for a new novel, it's totally different and a lot more challenging. I feel that a few years ago, if you were a, a competent translator and you had a relatively good series, almost immediately you would get tons of people jumping on board. Nowadays, I feel like it's not quite like that. What's your impression and what do you? what's your take on that? I definitely agree. Uh, absolutely. And we, we've we seen the scene change, uh, just say from our perspective, you know, when expectations about update frequency changed and then how monetization is handled. So we've definitely had to adjust our own workflow when it comes to that. And I, I think that's fine. That's just goes hand in hand with the scene maturing. But now that I've gone through the process of starting new novels and you know, picking no new projects, it's definitely that I've really come to, I guess, realize with dismay that the scene has changed drastically in ways that we can't control either. And it's for precisely the reasons that you've mentioned. I can pick a, you know, like a great, well-written novel like Necro, and I update twice a day, but I am still fighting very hard for readers and for visibility yeah and some of it is definitely just i guess limitations on web design you know if if you have a platform that deals with written content it's not like you can just flash pretty graphics or vids or videos at readers and and you know, it's it's harder to market the written word but then i feel it's just there's so much choice and variety out there and because of that, people are also less willing to give stuff a chance. You know, before we might have people just hop on board and try a series out for 50 or 100 chapters before giving it up and saying it's not for them. But now, like, I feel people will go into a new series and go, you know, straight off the bat, chapter one. Oh, they don't like the name of the main character. Okay. It's like, wait. <laughs> I think the earliest comment I've seen from someone dropping a series is, uh, I think, chapter five. <laughs> and they were just like, this is so confusing. I don't get it. Like, I, I just, I, I don't, I don't. I'm, I'm done. And I was like, dude, you're on chapter five. Like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's confusing. I'm, I'm on. Do you want like an info right off the bat? That's, that's going to be like a textbook. I don't want to read a textbook. So yeah, yeah. It's, 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 kind of, it's honestly kind of frustrating. Even just, I mean, five chapters is crazy. Even even a few mm -hmm. dozen chapters sometimes is is not enough. I just did a yeah. YouTube video of a reaction to a review of my translation. And the guy, <laughs> I think that he's a, he has a pretty big channel on YouTube, but my impression is he basically skimmed the first 40 chapters, missing out on some of the most obvious like plot points of the entire series and whatnot and but even that 40 ch 40 chapters in a, in a novel that's over a thousand chapters or maybe even two thousand that's definitely not quite enough um mm -hmm. to get a, a big picture what do you, is there anything that i mean what do you what solutions do you see to this you know i, I don't know, necessarily want to call it a problem because from the reader's perspective <laughs> i guess it's good that they have so much stuff to pick from but from the perspective of us translators what can be done to sort of you know, get get word out or to get get more readers for the novels when there's just so much stuff out there. 
It's honestly, it's tough. And I think you and I, we are actually better positioned than a lot of our colleagues because we've been in the scene for so long and we really try to be active on social media. So we actually have a better reach than a lot of folks. And I'm sure we all have readers that will give anything we do a try, you know, a legitimate, decent try just because we're the ones working on it. So uh, we definitely benefit from that. What I do is uh, I definitely leverage the networks that I've built up. Uh, so I am pretty active on Twitter. I'm not as on Instagram because I kind of ran out of pretty pictures for a while. You know, <laughs> life has been normal here, but like, you, there's still not much to do. I can't go anywhere. <laughs> so I don't like, I'm like, okay, I could take pictures of my home cooking, but I don't think anyone <laughs> wants to see like the 50th scallion pancake. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I definitely, uh, but I can share like uh, translation thoughts on my blog or share latest translation struggles on Twitter. And so that reaches a wider audience. And I definitely try really hard to leverage that. What I often do is I also throw a lot of events in the first couple of hundred chapters, you know, chapter 100, 200, or 300. And I throw giveaways or, you know, just whatever strikes me at that time. But obviously, that's an investment as well. And it, sometimes, you know, translators wouldn't want to pony up a couple hundred for something essentially that's just, you know, a chance for new readers to just take a glance at your novel. So I, I, I totally understand if a lot of people don't do this. Um, But yeah, I do a lot of outreach. I try to make a huge party, make a huge fuss that way. And actually, I've also done something with my earlier chapters that can bite me in the butt sometimes. So what I do is I try really hard to keep reader engagement in the first 50 chapters, because I've noticed that's where a lot of people drop off these days. And especially because Necro is unconventional. So like you the MC is thrown into the thick of things and a big, the world, there's a lot of mysteries surrounding this world that affect the cultivation system and the world building. So all of it honestly can be a pretty confusing mess in the first 50 chapters if you aren't, aren't used to this type of pace. So what I do in, in my translator thoughts, you know, I've actually created graphics about the world's geography and about like cultivation as we know it. And I, I try really hard to clear up any misunderstandings in the translator comments. So like I write like essay length comments sometimes, <laughs> but it's just, you know, it's a lot of extra work yeah. to be honest. Yeah. One thing I, I mean, if, if you Google and find my old posts like on SPCNet and whatnot, I think mm. anyone would find that for literally years now, I mean, I, I started translating uh, for fun Usha novels, I think in probably something like 2012 or something like that. I mean, for so for almost a decade now, I've been kind of on the pro commenting side. In other words, encouraging readers to comment and, uh, you know, do yeah. their part to kind of like spread the enthusiasm and, you know, recommend the project that they're, you know, excited about, whether it's a translation or original, or whatever. Uh, I think that that can help a lot. I mean, do you, I, I can't imagine you would disagree with that, right? No, I, I absolutely agree. Honestly, like we can try to do all this on, from our perspective, but what is most helpful is actually the readers recommending the novels or being active in the comment section, writing reviews, you know, whether it's on Wusha World or novel updates or other sites, it's, it's really, it's really down to the readers to make sure that, hey, if you like a series, then you either write a comment letting the translator know that you like this type of subject. So the translator will know that, hey, you know, a lot of people like this. I'm going to pick something similar next time. Or you recommend it to your friends and family. You know, hey, I mean, we can't go anywhere these days. So I'm sure people have watched a lot of their TV series and their backlog of movies. So why not pick up your know, web novel? It's uh, something new, something different. So. Yeah, I, yeah. I in these days, you know, to, when competition is so high, what can really help people stand out is from the readers themselves. Yeah, I am totally on board with that, especially the review thing, whether it's on Usha World, like you said, novel updates or for original stuff on Amazon, especially on Amazon, because the, the algorithm, we had a conversation about this in the 
on the server uh, last night <laughs> about reviews, but they're just really important for the algorithm on Amazon. And then on Wusha World, I we're kind of getting uh, toward our time limit here. I don't want to get derailed, but I personally don't really like the Wusha World system very much. Uh, I've t- chatted with people about this. Um, I think that it's not the most ideal. It's basically a thumbs up, thumbs down system. And I feel like it is not the ideal system. But regardless of that, if you're a reader of, of a novel or a series on Wushu World and you like it, take the time to leave that review because it really helps. And the thumbs up, thumbs down makes it even more, it makes it even easier for the people who drop it after five chapters to have a big influence on the rating of the novel. And I think it's, I personally think it's ridiculous that somebody can read a chap, read a book for five chapters, drop it, leave a thumbs down review. And then somebody who's read it for like a thousand chapters and then gives it a thumbs up has the, the, both of those reviews have equal weight. Uh, to me, it seems weird unless they've changed that. But point being just those point. people who do like this, the novels really need to leave those thumbs up. It really does help. Yeah. And I mean, just like, okay, from a purely selfish perspective, like if you like something, be loud and really vocal, you know, raise a fuss about it because otherwise like we, the translators or the authors will think, oh, hey, nobody really cares about this. Well, I guess I'm not picking this next time, you know? And this is the, it's the same for any creative industry, whether it's novels or music or videos, you know, like we, we read the feedback, we will make decisions based off of that feedback. So if you like something, you know, let people know about it you might not find more of it in the future or find much less of it in the future. Yes, indeed. So in the interest of keeping this pod, uh, podcast short and sweet, I think we're going to call it a day here. Is there any uh, anywhere you would like to point people to or any final uh, recommendation or anything, any last thing you would like to say before we call it a day? Definitely check out Necropolis Immortal. I think Anyone who loves any sort of web novel will find something they like about it. But otherwise, I do share a lot, you know, translator thoughts or other projects that I work on on my site at Valer.com. So you can go check that out for a list of everything I do. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining me on this inaugural episode. And uh, to everyone out there listening, I am your host, Jeremy Bai. You can find out all my information on jeremybai.com and check out etvaler.com for all of Etvo's information. And do check out Necropolis Immortal, which is on Wusha World. That's it for episode one, and I will see you next time. Bye, everyone.